checking the time. All right, you should be able to see my name and finally it looks like I can join the meeting now. That's great news. Excellent. Thank you. Well, welcome back everyone to our summit. Uh, thank you for hanging tight with all of our technical difficulties. Um, today I have the great pleasure of introducing and moderating these four incredible people as we discuss how to bridge academia and industry through inclusive technology. Mehran Sahami is a professor at Stanford University and, and is one of the top minds in machine learning and AI in academia. He is deeply mission driven and cares very deeply about the SDGs. And prior to joining the Stanford faculty, he was a senior research scientist at Google. Ashutosh Saxena is a visionary Stanford alum alumni entrepreneur who left academia to start a cutting edge distributed AI IO, IoT company called Casper AI, a digital butler of sorts that helps the elderly live a comfortable, healthy life at home. Jingbo Huang is the director of the United Nations University Research Institute in Macau. And during her 20 years of UN experience, she has held various managerial positions in the learning and development field in the UN, UNDP, United Systems Staff College, and UNESCO. Um, Mamelo is a principal research fellow at the United Nations University Institute in Macau, where he leads the Smart Citizen Cyber Resilience Project. This project is undertaking policy relevant to research, innovating technology tools, and undertaking capacity building activities to enhance the resilience of citizens and civil society stakeholders in smart digital futures. So please join us in welcoming these amazing panelists. And I will now turn it over to Radhika and Lucas. Lucas, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, thank you so much everybody for uh, making it to today's panel. It's, it's amazing to have everybody here. Um, we really do have some of the top minds in AI um, and it's very inspiring to see everybody here. Excited to ask questions. Um, and I think we can kick it off and uh, I'll give that over to Radhika. Um, uh, sure, and welcome again. Um, since Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs is one of the co-conveners, I also want to mention that Mehran is one of our faculty advisors. Nashutosh is one of the Stanford Angels funded entrepreneurs and both are doing amazing work. And uh, Jingbo, we're getting to know recently, but we're impressed as well with what the UN University um, Institute is doing. Welcome everyone. Um, we will get started by hearing perspectives from each of you. And uh, I'd like to suggest we get started with uh, Professor Mehran Sahami. Um, Mehran, uh, share some of your perspectives on um, just AI and how AI is helping society. But also, if you could weave in uh, either now or later in the dialogue, how you see um, AI transforming technology education. I know that's an area you're one of the leading minds in, in the world. So over to you, Mehran. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you so um, I can give you a little bit of an overview about some of the things we're doing. Um, you know, when we think about bridging academia and industry, um, one of the things that we think about with respect to AI for that is uh, not just the particular AI technology, but how the AI technology impacts people more broadly. And so, you know, one way we've done that is in a collaboration with some folks at Stanford and also Bloomberg Beta to sort of have this bridge from the academic world and the industrial world. Um, so with uh, collaborators, Rob Reich, Jeremy Weinstein and Hillary Cohen who are at Stanford and Roy Bahat and Lisa Waden who are at Bloomberg Beta, we put together a class on ethics, public policy and technological change. And much of the content of that class I'll get a little bit into is driven by changes in AI and how they affect lots of different aspects of work life, you know, personal relationships, personal identity. But the basic idea in terms of putting this class together was that um, we've been doing it for two years now is that we originally developed a course at Stanford about three years ago um, that was focused on ethics, public policy, and technological change. And it brings together these different viewpoints. So Rob Reich is a philosopher. Jeremy Weinstein is a, a political scientist. 
Uh, Hillary Cohen is kind of our course organizer, put it all together. I'm the computer scientist. And so we bring these different lenses to look at different issues from multiple perspectives. So if we want to look at an issue, say, like privacy, we can understand philosophically what does privacy mean? What is the value of privacy from the standpoint of policy? We can talk about what are the policies that exist around privacy? What are the new things that are coming down the, the road or have recently been passed, like GDPR in Europe or the California Consumer? Protection Act in California. And then from the technological standpoint, we can talk about different issues like differential privacy or how reasonable anonymization is to do or other kinds of technologies that we might bring to bear on protecting privacy and think about the interplay between all these things in the long term. So this was a class we done in Stanford for a few years, but we realized there's a lot of people who are no longer at Stanford. Um, you know, they're working professionals in industry. And so for the last two years, in partnership with Bloomberg Beta, which is a venture capital firm in San Francisco, uh, we put together a class for industry professionals. So this is, uh, you know, people who are engineers, product managers, venture capitalists, uh, executives at these companies. We had 70 students uh, in the first uh, set last year, and then this year, we just wrapped up the class about a month ago with 120 students, which was all done remotely because of the pandemic. And the class was organized into cohorts. So there would sort of be a class that was based on lecture and discussion. And then in the intervening weeks, there would be cohorts, some of which were based specifically at companies. Uh, they would have a discussion group just within their company. Others of them had people from multiple companies that were, they were led by small cohort leads who were people who had been students in the class in the last iteration. And so in that sense, we're fanning it out more broadly. In terms of the topics we're covering, and you know, I talked about data collection and privacy as one of them, but there's really five major themes. One of them is that on data collection, privacy, and civil liberties, certainly notions around data collection are something that comes to the fore even more with AI and thinking about data being one of the big powering pillars of AI, along with you know, other algorithms and greater technological computing power. Um, we talk about things like the large tech platforms and who has control over free speech and how that's regulated or the lack of regulation that might exist. Uh, we have a unit specifically on AI and autonomous systems where, among other things, we look at things like distributional consequences for labor. So as you build autonomous systems, who are the people who those systems are being built for? Who are the people who are excluded from that development process? And then how does that affect workers, for example, whose jobs might be displaced? And what does that mean from a policy standpoint down the line when people's jobs might be impacted by AI? How do we want to, as a society, deal with that? Um, we, we also talk about more micro level questions in terms of AI. So in terms of algorithmic decision making, which is having a much bigger impact on our lives and lots of high stakes decisions, we talk about issues around fairness, due process, transparency, explainability. Uh, how is AI is it getting integrated more and more into people's everyday life? Uh, how do they have a way to know what that AI is doing or to challenge its results or to get more transparency? And how is it fair or not fair, depending on not only the models that are used, but the kind of data that's poured into these systems? Um, and lastly, we talk specifically about notions of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech sector. Basically, who's at the table? Who gets to build technology? Who makes those decisions? Who's impacted by technology and may not have had a role in those decisions? And more broadly, societally, what is that? mean going forward in terms of protecting people who are vulnerable, while at the same time trying to have some guardrails around the people who are building the technology so that you know represents sort of our collective ideals as a society, as opposed to just a few decision makers who might otherwise be building that technology. So that's one thrust. Another thrust, just very quickly, is, is sort of making that notion of transparency and technology and understanding technology. One of the SDGs is education, and that's something we believe strongly in. In, is this program called Code in Place that we've done for a couple of years. So Chris Peach, uh, who there's a picture here, I really think of as the, the leader sort of intellectually and philosophically of the program. What we wanted to do was take the notion of programming and put it in the hands of thousands of people. So we took the first half of Stanford's introductory computer science course. We not only made it 
available online. But rather than the traditional MOOC model where you just put videos out there, we thought it's the human interaction that is the key to getting people to actually do work, get personalized attention, and complete the course. So we actually had uh, 900 volunteers from around the world help teach 10,000 students in small cohorts. Um, the completion rate was over 10 times what the completion rate is for a traditional MOOC. So a thousand percent of the completion rate. So it wasn't just a small gain. It was a huge difference in terms of who has access. And we wanted to show that this was repeatable, that this wasn't just a one-time phenomena. So we did it again this year. We're actually in the middle of it right now. We also inscripted our partner, Julie Zelensky from the computer science department at Stanford. And we got actually even more section leaders. We have 1100 people who are section leaders from around the world, helping us teach 12,000 students um, a course on introductory programming as a community service project. It's the people who are teaching or volunteers, the people who are taking the course, it's all free for them. And here's just to wrap up a little heat map of where the students are from all over the world. So it represents actually all seven continents. We actually have someone who's a researcher on a boat on in Antarctica, um, as well as the other continents represented. So we're really trying to go for a global feel. Um, that's how we're trying to use the power of computer science in partnership with people people in industry to help uh, you know, get more information out there and help get technology into the hands of more people. So I'll wrap it up there and pass it on. Thank you, Maran, for that inspiring uh, kind of uh, story perspectives, but also this class is really, really exciting an engagement there. Uh, next, um, we'd like to invite Ashutosh Saxena, the CEO of and founding CEO of Casper.ai a company that is truly transforming the life of the most vulnerable, the elderly. Um, Ashutosh, share, us, uh, share the story of Casper, but if you can also weave in a bit of your story as well. How, how did a brilliant academic in Cornell on a track to kind of be a professor leave that career and end up doing something like this? Weave that in as makes sense as well. Yeah, so these, my story and Casper's story go very closely together. Um, so. To just to give a sketch, right? I think I was one of the leading researchers of AI back at Stanford doing my PhD with Andrew Wing, wrote one of the first deep learning papers and have 15,000 citations. But then I uh, sat back a couple of years back and realized that this significant population, a significant demographic is underserved. Uh, and uh, this relates to the elderly population, anyone who is 65 years or older. Um, the life expectancy in the US is increasing to 85. Across the world, uh, there are billions of seniors, uh, just in US and Japan alone, there are 181 million seniors and there are fewer and fewer people to take care of them. The number of younger caregivers is expected to decrease in the same time frame. So we simply do not have enough people to take care of the seniors to perform daily tasks. And I realized that AI can come to the rescue here in many forms. Um, and I always have been excited about how to bring AI and in general technology to change the lives of the people. So, so I started Stanford, was a professor at Cornell University, um, where I also founded a company called Cognical, which is now called Catapult. It's going on a stack this year, uh, where there was a similar mission. There was an underserved population of people who do not have credit history. So about 30% of the people could not have access to uh, simple things like the cribs for their baby or uh, items like of daily use. So we built a technology where even with disregarding whether you have credit history or not, you can lease to purchase such items. So that created a societal impact, but it also created a unicorn company. Um, and, and that led me to say, okay, where can, else can we apply AI? Um, I, I think to, to take the impact of R&D and apply it to real world problems is very important. We need to impact how we can improve the society uh, in an economically friendly way. So um, we got in touch with David Sheraton, who is another, another one of the Stanford professors, uh, and Joe Anderson, and we founded a company, uh, Casper, to address this. Uh, and Joe brings in a year's, 30 years of experience in the management of senior retirement communities. So he understands that problem very well. And David has founded several companies in the past, including uh, being an investor in Google and VMware. How does it work? So first, uh, we, we start looking at homes as computers. 
So if you think about your home, you have at least 10 different appliances in your homes, right? Like you have refrigerators, you might have light bulb, you might have light switches. It turns out many of these devices already have sensors. They have computing capability on them. Just like your cell a smartphone has a processor, the devices in your home already have a processor. Now, all in all, a home like this that you are seeing on the right, if it has a few devices, now you have a computing system. You start thinking of home as a computing system in which people live. Um, on top of that, if you add AI advances that have uh, uh, we have made over the last decade, you have a substantial opportunity. So one additional thing that becomes important in this setup is privacy concerns. So most AI systems rely on data collection to the cloud anytime data is shared by a remote server at a community or a house privacy of residents could be compromised. So this is a critically important thing that we are sensitive to privacy. So we have uh, innovated uh, on what we call as the distributed edge AI, where instead of all the power that comes with the data being in servers of a giant corporation, the data lives on the edge. It is with the residents in the home uh, and that is privacy uh, preserving. Uh, and that allows us to do a lot of applications. So we don't have time to go too much into details, but just to give an example, um, this is the most single most powerful argument for having AI in retirement communities. Uh, falling, people not being able to wake up, no one knowing about something like this happening for hours or sometimes days is a daily problem. In every house, there is a substantial chance that uh, th we are worried about our loved ones. Are they fine? Um, with a home as a computing platform, uh, we are able to detect uh, I incidents such as falls uh, using our AI technology. Uh, and regardless of whether you are wearing a wearable like a watch or not, the AI sensor can learn the resident patterns. Uh, it can respond to what happened if someone fell or is inactive and someone can come to help. This is a problem for the whole senior de demographic across the world, uh, which, can, which we are solving with these smart homes. So this is just one of the several problems that can be solved with um, our AI technology. Uh, and just a reminder, it's a home that is a smart. So even if you don't have access to these variables, uh, you can solve a, a lot of such problems. So today we are taking this idea of how to have an impact on this underserved demographic. And we have started building communities uh, and addressing problems of home, sorry, of health at home across Nevada, California, Japan, and expanding to Chicago, Minneapolis, and several other uh, geographies uh, to improve the lives. So I will uh, stop here. Um, and uh, this is a quick story of why we are bringing the AI to have a real world impact. Uh, and in this case, the elderly population, which is underserved. Thank you, Ashutosh. There's been some questions uh, coming in. How does AI specifically help the SDGs? I think uh, you gave one very powerful answer. The key spirit of the SDGs is to leave no one behind. And what better way than to help, help the elderly have a safe uh, and uh, comfortable life in their homes. Um, um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Jingbo Wang and a colleague Mamelo um, to talk about the amazing work happening in the United Nations University's uh, Research Institute in Macau. I'm sure Jingbo will be telling us about many other ways that AI helps achieve the SDGs. And one of the questions that's come in, Jingbo, if you'd also like to address, is um, how can we address the direct environmental impacts of AI? Is the work being done to improve the efficiency of and reduce the GAG emissions associated with AI? So if you also want to roll that in, um, that would be very helpful, or we can come back to that in the dialogue. But I do want to mention that Ashutosh is helping on environmental impact as well. Like uh, there's a lot more efficient energy usage. Uh, we didn't get into that, but Casper actually helps energy optimization in the home as well. You can come back to that in the dialogue. But Jingbo, over to you and Mamelo. Thank you, Radhika. I like the sunny weather behind you. And good afternoon and uh, good morning, good evening to everyone. Uh, we're uh, the United Nations University Research Institute in Macau, and actually here is uh, 7, 7.30 in the morning. 
Uh, my name is Jingbo Huang, the director of the Research Institute. Today, I'm here with uh, one of our principal researcher, uh, uh, Dr. Mamelo Tignani, because we would like to send a message to all the students and all the uh, participants, because we know that you are on your way to decide on your future career. And uh, this topic of this particular um, webinar is on the, uh, the academia industry and uh, the potential connection for an entrepreneurship. So we would like to share a different angle, which is how can you initiate a entrepreneurship in research career uh, as, a, as a young talented um, uh, fellow in uh, Stanford or in other universities. So our research institute is working exactly on this field, in this field. So we look at, in general, digital technologies and how the digital technologies can uh, help achieve uh, SDGs. So this is our bigger angle. If we look into a, a smaller, uh, smaller scale in the projects that we're conducting, we have a various uh, a spec broad spectrum of pro projects ranging from uh, cybersecurity, AI ethics, climate modeling, all the way to uh, migrants and technolo technology, gender and technology. So later, Dr. Mamelo Tignani will share with you some of uh, his research areas. But the message that I would like to share and send to our students are, uh, is there could be a possibility of uh, engaging in this uh, technology for S SDG work from the research perspective. If you're interested, feel free to join us for uh, an internship and maybe become our research fellow. And also, if you don't choose to go that way, and you can certainly work in industry, and uh, I know California has tons uh, to offer, but you can always think about the technology for good, for social good. And once you become a billionaire, you can think about uh, uh, investing in some of these projects. Um, now I would like to invite um, Dr. Tignani, and he will uh, approach this topic from his research and also how he became a researcher in, uh, in uh, 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 technology for people, uh, vulnerable population, for example. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tignani, please. Thank you very much, Jimbo. And uh, thank you very much for the moderators and organizers for inviting us. Um, I'd like to do a couple of things uh, before I get into my story in this space. Um, and that is to think about this question of how does technology impact on sustainable development in, in two specific ways. I think um, a lot of us, we spend a lot of time, decades in this space of digital development, thinking about ICT for development. And we've always thought about the piece of how does technology, innovation, entrepreneurship contribute to sustainable development. So we can think about that in terms of, you know, how does technology amplify individual capabilities? How does technology enable institutions and communities and governments uh, to achieve some of these targeted SDG goals? But I think there's another question that's more interesting to ask as well. And I think this is the question that sometimes either within the tech space, within academia, we're not always comfortable to ask that question. And that's the question of how do we infuse sustainability into our practice? So not only how do we help solve the world problems, how do we help you know, fix the problems of the developing countries and the so-called third world countries, but more importantly, where we are in our innovation processes, in our technology designs, how do we make sure that we achieve sustainability? How do you make sure that we leave no one behind, we embed diversity in these processes as well? And I think this is definitely the key question that if we think about our work and contributions that we are able to make, we need to start interrogating exactly where does some of these challenges lay. So for example, a lot of us, we have to confront some of these contradictions that we faced with every day. So for example, thinking about big tech and thinking about some of the companies that we celebrate within the technology industry and thinking about the concentration of power of data and digital concentration that happens vis-a-vis -vis SDG 10 about reducing inequalities, right? How do we uh, resolve this contradiction of at one hand celebrating big tech, concentration of power, digital concentration, and at the same time, be aspiring to have reduced inequalities between countries within countries. 
these are some of the contradictions that we have to interrogate and think about. So for example, beyond that, how are we comfortable? A lot of us, we are comfortable with the idea of planned obsolescence of our digital devices, right? Most of us every year, every two years, we're gonna replace our digital devices and get a brand new phone. But at the same time, we have SDG 12 imperatives around responsible consumption and responsible production, right? All the environmental concerns that are associated with that. So I think more than often, uh, the questions really come back to us. I mean, sustainable development is not something that happens out there. It's about how do we infuse some of these values and goals into the design of our technologies? So there's been some talk already about how do we make our algorithms more fair and more less, less biased, for example. Right, these are questions that as technology designers, as innovators, we need to be thinking about as well. Um, other examples, there's so many of these contradictions that I think we need to uh, uh, tease out and, and confront. So for example, lots of companies that are very comfortable with uh, investing in the elimination of human trafficking and forced labor within their supply chains. And yet closer to home, we have to deal with issues of exploitation of uh, employees within the gig economy, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think a lot of the work that we've been doing in Macau has been interrogating some of these challenges to try and identify what are some of the policy relevant interventions that allow us to really uh, address some of these core issues of, of sustainability. Um, and so lastly, I think um, the question that really comes back to us is how do we infuse some of this diversity within our lectures, within our technology designs? How do we make sure that we give space for diversity of voices and perspectives to be heard? And for example, within our boardrooms, how do we make sure that we address SDG 5 and have representation of women and females within the management of companies? So once again, in a very quick nutshell, those are some of the questions that we are addressing. I'll be happy to talk a lot more in detail about some of the projects that we've done in Africa, in India, and in Macau around digital development that have actually enabled us to really interrogate some of these questions in a lot more detail. But I'm really glad that this is the question that this seminar is focused squarely on. I think these are the discussions that we need to be having right now. And the more we think about them, the more we realize that actually sustainable development doesn't happen out there. It doesn't happen in the global south, in the third world. It actually happens in our boardrooms. It happens in our lecture theaters. It happens in our communities. So that's a quick nutshell. Uh, and I'm happy to chat a bit more in detail about some of these other experiences and some of the work that we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mamelo Jingbo, um, for those inspiring perspectives, especially for our young students here. Uh, Luca Sanu, do you guys have questions? Do we have any more in the audience? Um, or you want me to jump in with a question? I had a question, if you don't mind me jumping in. Um, Mamelo, I think you touched on this as well, um, but this is open to anybody who uh, would like to respond. Um, you mentioned that there's sometimes a contradiction in uh, big tech, but also uh, achieving advancements in AI um and the policy of what goes into creating a sustainable ai um and i think a lot of the times it's viewed as contradictory to have regulations or limitations on ai but also want it to advance so my my question is have you has anybody here um seen any policies perhaps or um government actions that you think are both advancing AI, but also protecting sustainability at the same time um, and privacy um, with regards to data um, and personal security and privacy. Yeah, so I'll take a quick dig at that. So I think um, what we, we're sitting with now and sometimes what happens is sometimes we start with exciting technology designs, technology innovations, uh, which, of course, if you're a computer scientist or technologist, that's, that's exciting. That's a good space to be in. And then sometimes we then later, uh, in retrospect, infuse some of these other concerns around privacy, around security, around biases, et cetera. Um, so I think sometimes what ends up happening is that you end up having legislation and guidelines catching up with what's happening in technology. So, for example, you know, at, at the legislative level, things like GDPR, which are you know, at the European EU level, it's meant to address some of these concerns around data privacy and data protection. And there's a lot of effort as well at different levels. So both across industry, where, for example, you have these AI ethics guidelines that are being developed uh, by different companies. And there's quite a few of those that we spend time analyzing to try and understand exactly what are some of these interventions that need to be undertaken. But really to your question, 
Um, I think those contradictions, it's not a given that there should be contradictions. I think it's about where do we start? If we start with sustainability, fairness, justice, leaving no one behind, there are ways, and some of the panelists have actually discussed some of those ways where we can ensure that we still have privacy in our technology designs. We can still have algorithms that are efficient and that don't have any adverse environmental concerns, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to be a bit more intentional, both in our technology designs to make sure that we infuse those soft goals, societal goals into our practice. I very much agree with Mamelo. I think he you know, hit the points right on the head. And I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that there's, there's important cultural differences in different parts of the world around what issues are around things like privacy or you know, rights of the individual. There isn't a monolithic set of what is agreed upon globally as what those rights are. And if you see, you can see an example of that very clearly if you look at the divide between, say, Europe and the United States in terms of how they look at issues around privacy, GDPR being sort of one leading example of that. Um, just in the last few days, the European Union announced new potential regulations around AI, including facial recognition and other sort of, you know, algorithmic protections. Um, you know, we don't have anything like that in the United States right now. And there, it's a very culturally different uh, set of factors. If you look at notions around free speech, for example, and the regulation of large tech platforms, those are also very different in different countries. So I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is that globally, we don't have agreement on these things. And that's why it's not just a technology issue. We actually need to understand from a policy and, and sort of cultural perspective, where are the places we actually have commonalities to agree. Thank you, Marana. Uh, Mamelo, I know you had a question. Um, I, I don't have a question right now. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I thought we were going to go next, Radhika. Um, ah, sure. Sorry, okay. I, I thought we were chatting and we had a disconnect on who had the question. I have a question for sure. Uh, so um, for all of you, um, one thing that um, really I think a lot about is at some level, companies like Ashutosh is the work Mehran is doing, you guys are doing Jingbo Mamelo. I see how AI and technology is transforming and helping us leapfrog on the SDGs on so many dimensions as a powerful lever of change. And yet I also see that the digital divide is growing so rapidly, whether it be rural women in India are being so left behind, whether it's because of access or socioeconomic norms, but a new form of inequality is rapidly growing the digital divide and it's not just about access. Um, have you all thought about this? What are your thoughts on how do we make sure that uh, particularly AI doesn't become yet another divide and it's more, a, it's more a bridge, especially in the spirit of leaving no one behind, anyone who'd like to go. And I can give a quick comment on that one. I think it has to do with data and AI, right? So. Uh, what we are seeing is that some of these large corporations, they have amassed an insane amount of data, and that gives them a tool to solve a lot of societal problems, but also the, that, that benefit of that data gets concentrated in a certain structure. Uh, because all the data goes to one place, all the AI gets powerful, and little benefits go on the edge. Uh, but I think the solution is that when we are designing AI, we need to think about to make it closer to where the needs are. So at Casper, what we do is that the computing as well as the economic benefits lie with the people when they are doing things in the field or in different areas. And such distributed AI where we are having, not giving the power of all the data to one single entity, but the owners of the data are the groups of people who are using it, is a generally lo good long-term direction to have the benefits reach to the people who are using it. Yeah, just some quick thoughts on that. So I think the point that you, you're raising is actually important and crucial. Um, we've been looking a lot at the global risk report that's released by the World Economic Forum for 2021. And interestingly within that, within the top 10 risks that they identify is this idea of digital power concentration. Um, that's within you know, the same category as extreme weather, as climate action failure, so it is a big problem. It is a big deal. And I think this is discussed both in terms of 
power asymmetries between countries and within, within countries, so different sectors of society. Um, I think the question uh, that um, the issue that Ashton has highlighted is important. So data is a big part of the story. It's, it's, that's the food of AI algorithms. So without inclusive data, without data that's representative, of course, you're always going to have this problem of the outcomes that are equally unrepresentative. But I think there's also a whole chain of other assemblages that contribute to this. So there's the issue of the skills and, and you know, within different countries, how do you make sure that we do advance the necessary skills uh, to make sure that AI algorithms are context specific and context relevant. And there is a lot of work in this space. Uh, there's some commendable efforts, uh, a lot of MOOCs that are available online to try and advance the skills development so that around the world and for different sectors, there's actually uh, a development of, of the necessary capacity. Um, so at the same time, so if you think about data, skills, you also need, um, let's say, institutional frameworks and structures to be in place. So everything that we talked about earlier about, you know, guidelines, frameworks, legislation to enable effective use of AI, those need to be in place as well around the world. And I think definitely to your point, these are spaces that we need to make sure that uh, we increase representation, we increase reach uh, through other parts of the world as well. Thank you, Romelo. Uh, I have a question um, about bias in AI systems. So, you know, this is a huge topic and how do we combat bias um, within uh, AI and machine learning and who gets to lead an organization's effort to identify that bias and um, be able to make those changes in regards to uh, how the algorithm is, uh, is constructed? Yeah, so I think a critical point here is um, not just the organization, but what you really want is, you know, what is in the benefit of society and what, what societal controls are there? And, you know, to Mamelo's point right now, in terms of about the concentration of technology in the hands of a few people who have a lot of data and the resources to use it, is that they also get to make all the decisions. Right. And so there is no uh, democratic appeal. There is no notion of if people don't like how AI is being applied to them or the results of it, what recourse they have other than just trying to appeal to these companies to actually do something. And so part of the notion is what are the guardrails that are in place where, um, you know, there is a notion of the basic levels of fairness, you know, what data sort of being used in these algorithms, what methods are being used, what sorts of accountability is there. But at some level, what sort of public audit is there, right? If algorithms are being applied, and this is something San Francisco, for example, uh, the city has been looking at their board of supervisors in terms of actually what sort of auditability should be required for algorithms. And so if you have particular kind of measures that you want to have to look at the results of algorithms across different populations or with respect to different sorts of uh, impacts, what are the metrics you have? Who gets to decide them? What is the frequency at which they're updated? And then what is the recourse? And part of that is the notions of due process and transparency. So we have all these, this machinery in the legal system, right, that we've used in the legal system for years. We don't apply any of it to algorithms, even when the algorithms now replace human beings that were previously bound by those same structures. Yeah, just a quick thought from my side as well. Um, so I think a lot of times we will talk about bias in, in data. Um, and I think sometimes we need to take a step back uh, from data. I think sometimes we think about the systems and these algorithms as having a mind of their own. Um, unfortunately, the systems are, are built and sometimes they represent the reality in the world. So if the data that you train your algorithms on is already biased, you need to deal with bias at the societal level. Um, I think there's only so much we can ask these algorithms to do if we don't deal with the underlying biases, we don't deal with the underlying power asymmetries in society, then you never have these mechanisms of challenging decision-making within algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a bigger question than what you do at an algorithmic and data level. Of course, there's a lot of work that's happening there, a lot of exciting work, but we need to go a step before that. How do we ensure that our societies are less biased? How do you ensure that there's more representation and voice and decision-making and less power symmetries in our societies so that the tools and the products and the systems that we develop reflect that reality as well. So that's my quick thoughts on that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Amiran uh, Mamelo. Unless uh, Jingbo Ashutosh, you have, uh, you want to comment on this? I wanted to take us in a different direction. A quick, quick comment is that I think uh, the automated systems are a byproduct of data, people, and the societal structures. So one has to put all of that together to come up with the outcome and uh, review process that Miran mentioned. So it's, it's a complicated problem. Uh, one, one more note from me. Technology issues are never technology issues alone. It's usually the people issues. So that's why we need to bring all the partners together. So that's one of the goals of our UNU in Macau. Thanks. Thank you. Um, now, last five minutes, some question for Ashutosh and then anyone else who would like to um, comment on this. Um, you have brought uh, distributed AI as a force of change to advance the SDGs at Casper Ashutosh. Um, yourself, the academics involved, including uh, Ken Berman at Cornell. Um, and uh, so um, the question is, what else can distributed AI do for the sustainable development goals? What is the future of distributed AI? And what are the possibilities we can achieve there? And Miran, any of you want to comment, Jingbo, Mamelo? Let's start with Ashutosh and Jingbo. We haven't heard enough from them. So I think very good question. Uh, traditionally, the AI has been thought of as a central data store on which a algorithm runs and the outcome is seen by the other people, which is a recipe for concentrating the power into fewer hands. What distributed AI does is that it transforms that structure into a distributed structure where small pieces of data are in, in different places. And that technology that David Sheraton and myself and Ken Berman researched on allows a path where the different benefits logic is at different places spread across the world. So some examples are, um, for example, you are doing energy management. You do not need to give power to a single entity about getting all the data and making all the power decisions. The power can be locally generated. Uh, it can be locally consumed. Efficiencies become local. Uh, it becomes a platform on which many other applications can run. For example, uh, some of my colleagues at Microsoft uh, and FarmBeats are using IoT devices to advance the agriculture. Now you do not want to give all the power of agriculture and food production into a few corporate hands, but a distributed AI can have that logic which serves the need of that geography because every geography is also different. Every region is different, people are different. So if that logic or the algorithm is running in a distributed AI way on that town in that fashion, the economic benefits of data and logic stay there. So I believe that technically that platform can really allow a distributed economics where people in the, that region are reaping the benefits of that platform. They did generate the data, the logic is adapted to them. The algorithms are designed in on the edge for them and the AI works for them. So I, I think it's an amazing uh, uh, direction which can forward several SDG goals. Thank you, Ashutosh. We just have a couple of minutes. So any of the speakers quick uh, 30 second, one minute uh, response on this as we wrap up or any closing, uh, final closing thoughts? Just a quick one from me. Uh, sustainable development is something that happens where we are in our boardrooms, in our lecture theaters. It doesn't happen out there. So all of us have a role to play and we can do a big difference. Yeah, I would very much agree with Lamello. The, the notion of, um, you know, sometimes people feel powerless in kind of this large, you know, universe that's going on. They kind of feel that though they don't have any individual agency. Um, and in fact, you know, everyone has a lot of agency, not whether or not they're only, you know, whether they're a technologist developing this stuff or they're a product manager or they're someone who's working in the legal system or social system or NGOs. But, you know, in many countries, people are able to vote. And that actually is a powerful tool to be able to get the kind of outcomes you want with AI. Um, any final thoughts as we wrap up? Um, again, I invite uh, <clears throat> all of the students and the interested uh, young people to join us from the research perspective and uh, looking at how we can bring people together to solve these uh, technology issues. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers. 
Ashutosh, Mehran, Jimbo, and Lamello for their amazing perspectives. And thank you to our moderators, Radhika and Lucas, for doing such a great job in moderating this panel.